Please welcome to the stage, Michelle Guida, Executive Vice President, Geopolitical Strategy and Risk, Weber Shandwick. Good morning. In April of 1975, my mother and grandmother fled Vietnam amid the fall of Saigon. They escaped communism to take a chance at a new life of freedom. Fast forward to Southern California where they settled and where my grandmother helped raise me. And the one thing that I remember her doing every morning was reading the newspaper. Thanks to the Orange County Register, she was up to speed on all of the local, national, and global news that was shaping her new home here in the United States. And reaping the benefit of a free press was not just a luxury, but a right that she valued and that she took advantage of every day. So I'm excited to introduce an important conversation here this morning about journalism amid an era of remarkable disruption. And as we begin, it's important to remember this is not a new challenge. Information has been used and it's been misused throughout the course of history to advance both noble and malicious causes, from disinformation campaigns in ancient Rome to the explosion of mass communication following the invention of the Gutenberg Press. Today's disruption is equally pivotal and equally complex. The proliferation of technology platforms, of social and digital media, bots, 5G, AI, all of these are intersecting with media and other forces like politics, policy, culture, and business. Weber Shandwick, as a global communications firm that sits in nearly every media and financial and political capital in the world, has a unique vantage point at the epicenter of these colliding forces. And what we see is a state of incoherence, a high demand for seeking truth amid the swirl. And in this regard, the role and the responsibility of journalism is as essential as ever. But it's also never been more complicated, more questioned, and in some cases more vilified. And in a world of mis- and disinformation, journalism itself is at an existential crossroads. But the good news is, there's a role for all of us to play in contributing to a solution. As a senior advisor to Concordia, I'm glad to say that this is only the first in an ongoing conversation around how all parties can come together. Journalists, communicators, public, private, civic, creators and consumers of information to examine and to shape the future of media. When it comes to the new threats brought about by the disruption in journalism, tackling these will require focus, it'll require vigilance. All of us who touch information can commit first to deeper learning about the risks, the actors, the motivations behind the spread of disinformation. This is the first step to building media security and mitigating attacks that use media in whatever form it comes in to inflict harm on organizations, on groups, and individuals. On the other hand, while we're focused on the challenges and the new problems that come from disruption in media, we can also do so without losing sight of the opportunity. I had the honor of serving recently as the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs, leading communications for the United States all across the world. And in that time, I saw the degree to which new technologies, information, empowered media, empowered journalism, as well as individual voices all across the world to have a say to share knowledge and to shape their own future. What we have now is the opportunity to create a new era of journalism, of media, and an information age to fuel those who are seeking truth, like my grandmother, who is reading the newspaper every day at our kitchen table, and to empower those who can power humanity to new heights. That's what, what's at stake, and it's our time now to get this right. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Blake Hounshell, Managing Editor, Politico, Rashida Jones, President, MSNBC, and Noah Shackman, Editor, Rolling Stone.
Thanks for being here, Rashida and Noah. Um, no one's probably here to listen to me, they're here to listen to you, so uh, without much preamble, I will get right to the questions. Um, both of you guys have just taken over your new positions recently. You're about six months, is that right, at MSNBC? Almost eight months, actually. Eight months? Okay. Four years, I'm not Time sure Time passes years. swiftly. And Noah, you've been at Rolling Stone for about five minutes now? Five minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, and, and recall when you did when that job was announced, yeah. um, there's a quote that stuck in my head that you said, which is, everything has got to be faster, harder, and louder. Yeah. And my question about that is, is that kind of the moment we're in in journalism? In order to, to break through with audiences, everything has to be faster, harder, or louder. Is there room for quieter, slower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think in Rolling Stone's case in particular, um, they needed to, they, we need to amp up our like digital news operation, right? And so particularly for them, for us, it's weird, I yeah. just started this job. <laughs> uh, you know, like that's, that's just one of the things that needs to happen. Rolling Stone had, uh, had periods in which it was famously hostile to the internet, and so it was really important, it is really important that, you know, um, you, know you get, look, the, the price of entry for the news game is by having a, a, a robust web operation and, and being able to, to break through. So I think that um, it's true for Rolling Stone. Is there a place for quieter and softer? Um, sure, yeah, I think, you know, you see the occasional like magazine piece or whatever breakthrough, uh, certainly in the documentary world, you'll see stuff that's a little bit more lean back breakthrough. But like, I think what's true about um, the news game in general is you need to have at least one party or operation that's uh, faster, lar uh, harder, and louder. Mm. Rashida, is that the same thing? You're in the cable news business, which yeah. is sometimes criticized as a shout fest. Um, is that kind of the mantra that you have at MSNBC? Do you have to break through by being louder and grabbing attention? Our focus is a little different in that, you know, our, our kind of guiding principle is we want to be smarter. And so it's not about let's find two people who are going to be very loud and let them duke it out for minutes and see what happens. We try to be more thoughtful. We try to be smarter. But we also want to have range and texture. And there are some programs that are fast paced and it's reporters across the world and, and all of the things that are happening in the moment. There are some shows that will spend 23 minutes um, walking you through a story uh, that you find interesting, intriguing, and you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. And there are some programs where we take a deep dive into a singular topic. And so, you know, our goal is rather than play the, you know, I'd call it the cable version of clickbait, like let's go find those moments and, and put them out there and, and get the short term payoff. We want to have a variety of experiences. Sometimes the, the fast moving, uh, you know, uh, on the ground across the world programming makes sense for a certain day part or certain talent. Sometimes the more thoughtful content makes sense. Sometimes the, the deeper thinking stuff makes sense. And we want to offer all of it. So, in the vein of the, the loudest voice in the room, um, Donald Trump, he's gone, sort of. Um, there's been a lot of chatter, including from him, that his departure from the presidency has kind of left the news business with, without its largest driver of stories. And, and I'm curious, from your perspective, Rashida, if you, in any sense, miss Donald Trump being present every day. Um, I, I think there's a whispered conversation among uh, media people, which is maybe that jo Joe Biden is a little boring. And I'm wondering if you feel that in your daily work. I mean, we cover, we've covered the administrations very differently. Um, during the Trump administration, things were happening at such a breakneck pace that we were really being responsive and reactive to what's happening. The pivot that we've been able to make, and I think you know, for the most part we see it um, as an opportunity, is the new cycle isn't determined for us. We get to set the agenda. We get to decide what the priorities are, um, and, and it's been refreshing for us. You know, there, there were two different you know, kind of tones in the coverage over the course of the administrations, but I'd rather go into a cycle where we can decide what's important. We have the space to cover things that um, are important to our audiences, important to the communities, that we just didn't have the time and space to do during a breakneck speed um, administration. How about you, Noah? Do you miss Trump at all? Well, 
I mean, first of all, no amount of ratings or clicks are worth, you know, the brush with fascism that uh, we had in the Trump administration. And so, I, honestly, that other stuff I don't really give a shit about. Um, I, but I'd also note that at my old shop, The Daily Beast, you know, which was pretty famously uh, anti-Trump and did a lot of great political coverage, which is why uh, Politico kept trying to hire uh, all of its reporters. We had some success. Uh, some <laughs> beat, back, uh, beat you back sometimes, lost other times. Anyway, um, our, I think the biggest traffic month ever uh, at the Daily Beast was a month or two ago. Uh, so, you know, long after mm. Trump had left the White House. So I don't really, I, I don't know, I don't miss Trump. You know, it's, he is a great story, yes. The movement that he's inspired is fascinating to cover, yes. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. Let me ask you this. Now that you're uh, at a music magazine, yeah. Rolling Stone, um, presumably Trump supporters also listen to music. Yeah, um, <laughs> presumably. Have you, <laughs> have you had a conversation about how do you reach that audience in Rolling Stone? And I would ask the same question of Rashid. Yeah, look, I, so first of all, we've got a lot of music coverage and a lot of stuff that's, you know, we're evaluating the art for its own sake or we're evaluating the artists for their own sake, right? So there's a very big um, Trump supporter named Kanye West. Uh, I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he had an album out the other day and we covered the shit out of that album. So does that appeal to Trump supporters? Mm hmm. You know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, you know, there's also the biggest star in country right now is a guy named Morgan Whalen. Uh, he's been involved in a bunch of controversy right now. We cover, we're covering that really closely. So, you know, I don't really, in general, I try not to play the demographics game. I try not to play the red blue game. Mm -hmm. I, I don't try to play any of those games. What I'm really trying to do is just, you know, cover stuff great, and and you know, celebrate great art, and celebrate great artists, and then you know stir up some trouble. And so that's kind of where I'm at. I, I'm not going to worry about like, you know, is the readership coming from, you know, Biloxi or Brooklyn. How about you, Rashida? What's uh, a Trump reporter, a Trump supporter, do you ever think about should they watch MSNBC? Well, the way we kind of structure our programming, we have some day parts that are not, that are decidedly not focused on politics. They're focused on news of the day, reporting on the ground, not necessarily through the lens of politics. So we offer variety. There are parts of the day where the programming that we're covering um, won't even mention politics and it doesn't, you know, put it through that lens. So we, you know, the goal for those day parts is we want to be broad, we want to be immersive, we want to cover the country and the world as it's happening and, and it has nothing to do with what your political leaning is. There are other shows that are more heavily focused on politics, more focused on putting stories, stories through those lenses. Um, and you know, not many s supporters watch that programming, but the focus of those programs are kind of, um, you know, taking the news of the day, putting it through the lens of that host who may or may not fall anywhere on the, on the spectrum. Um, so one of the other things that's, that's happening in, in media right now, aside from a, a change in political power, um, is a change in, in who uh, gets represented. Mm -hmm. And I know you've made a lot of efforts on that front. Uh, I'm curious what you think about um, the moment we're in culturally, broader than politics. Um, a lot of news outlets are, are uh, making efforts to be better about diversity, mm -hmm. um, put different voices, different faces forward. Um, how, do, how do you think about that moment that we're in right now? And is it a moment or is it a permanent shift in journalism? Um, I hope it's a, a permanent shift in how we think about what journalism is, who brings journalism um, to, to your living rooms and homes. You know, I, every single person in our universe, I can speak for MSNBC in particular, every host who's had a new opportunity in the last year, every leader who's had a new opportunity, these are people who were talented well before this reckoning. They had a voice, they had a perspective, um, they had an important take on what's happening in the world well before this moment that we're in. Um, one of the, the, the benefits that I get sitting in the chair that I do, I get to be uh, more selective in who the voices are that get elevated, who those, what opportunities that they get. 
And so whether it was now, if I had this opportunity five years ago or five years from now, these are all people that would get the opportunities that they've earned. So, so I, my hope is it's not something that's just happening because the world woke up one day and decided it's probably a good idea for um, the, the people that we watch and the people who lead us to better represent the country that we're in. But for me in particular, I'm committed to, to this being how we operate. Do you find ever, uh, and feel free either of you to jump into this question, that you have to retrain your audience as well? Um, I was looking at the, the Rolling Stone website before I came in here, and the number one story in your site, Noah, is about the Genesis Revival Tour. Yeah, I, I think that has more to do with the broken top story widget on the <laughs> busted ass website, which will be corrected okay. soon. But yeah, look, you're you're hitting at something which is important, which is you know the classic rock origins of Rolling Stone can't um, turn out to be some sort of uh, leather studded cage. You know, we've got them. You know, ultimately, Rolling Stone is about youth culture, and so that means it's about hip hop and reggaeton. Uh, you know, much more than it is about um, about classic rock or anything like that. And obviously, we're gonna you know dive into and celebrate all different kinds of music. And I think you'll see that um, uh, next month. The covers uh, we do this series called Musicians on Musicians, which are one older musician and one younger one. And I think you'll you'll see some really cool pairings there, some unexpected pairings. Um, but look, Rolling Stone can't be, you know, can't just put. Mick Jagger on the cover or whatever, uh, and I think if you look at our array of covers, you know, this year with, you know, Billie Eilish and Issa Rae and Dua Lipa, you know, it's much more about the here and now than it is about, um, you know, some heyday, and you know, I'm, I don't really. <laughs> Listen, I'm a Gen X guy, man. I didn't like those baby boomers who <laughs> start out. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but like you know, I, that's just not my not my thing at all. And as a kid who grew up in New York and you know grew up with hip hop and grew up with reggae, like and you're a musician too, right? Uh, I would say I'm a former musician at this point, but yeah, I made my living you know on the road uh, for a couple of years, and so bass. Play bass guitar. Yeah. Thank you. I'll find this it on good. YouTube. Yeah, no, yeah. The, unfortunately, there are some YouTube clips uh, out there with a with a pretty bad '90s goatee um, <laughs> featured. Um, yeah, but uh, look, it, it ultimately, you know, both questions are linked in that you know the future of music, culture, politics, what have you, is a is a future that's um, more diverse and more inclusive, and, and frankly, is a lot more interesting. Than just a bunch of people who look like each other, you know, playing the same music, having the same conversations, talking the same talk to one another. So, I'm, like, I'm incredibly excited about the moment. At the same time, there's also a bit of a backlash, I think, to the moment we're in. And I think about the the rise of phenomena like Substack, which I think there's lots of aspects about it that are really empowering, where you've got writers going off on their own and um, starting their own publications. And some of them are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year doing this. But I think it's unavoidable that if you look at a lot of the journalists who have had success on Substack, um, there, a lot of them are channeling a backlash to the very kinds of inclusivity that we're all talking about right now. I'd, I'd be super careful about over-interpreting Substack. I would just say that um, without violating any trust, that two of the biggest names um, that have been associated with Substack have recently been going around to magazines hat in hand because they can't um, make make the business work. So I would be careful about um, about over interpreting Substack in particular. Your point about the backlash obviously is well taken, and yeah, there. Guess what? There's a backlash to every change. Yeah. You know. But I do think, and you know, for for a network like ours, and we just celebrated 25 years, there may be um, kind of communities or moments that pop up where, you know, journalists feel like we want to take it into take things into our own hands, or our voice isn't being represented, and so we want to represent it. We're always going to be and should be challenged to continue to do better in that space. But we also bring a legacy and a brand strength to the table that you you just can't stand up individually. You can't stand that up um, unilaterally. And, and so, again, if I had the choice between um, the integrity of the brand that I represent and kind of the independents doing it their way, 
you know, 10 days out of 10, I'd bet on that brand with some history and legacy. So a lot of television networks are starting streaming services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned 25 years. MSNBC has been this, um, I would say, what's the right word? Sub-brand, co-brand of NBC, um, spin-off of NBC uh, for a while now. Peacock just launched recently. Um, CNN is getting into digital streaming with CNN Plus. Um, wh why is that happening and who's watching television 24-7? Well, I am. We just talked about my schedule where I watch everything. But it goes back to the question you asked earlier about um, train, training the audience. and and. I think what we've done is rather than try to train the audience to come back to where we are or to come come to more traditional platforms, we've trained ourselves to go to where they already are. And so the audiences, especially younger audiences, are consuming content on their own schedule, on streaming or in linear formats on streaming, but they're going to places other than cable. And so part of our strategy is we want to fortify what we're doing on traditional cable. It is a brand and a legacy. Um, that has a deep connection with the audience that, that you know, we pour our kind of core into. But we want to make sure we're showing up in all of these places. So you mentioned Peacock. We stood up a channel on Peacock that's really focused on the perspective programming that you see on linear and really talented folks who are also interchangeable with some of our linear talent. You'll see them you know, at 6 o'clock on Peacock and 8 o'clock on MSNBC. And really the goal is, rather than try to convince these younger audiences to come back from a platform that they've already abandoned, how can we show up in the way they want to see the programming on the places where they are? Are you on TikTok, Noah? I, I've got a stalker account on TikTok, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a stalker account. I saw you mention in an interview uh, that you you rely on your kids in some ways to plug into youth culture. Uh, I would say that had more to do with um, the New York Times writer uh, <laughs> wanting to project that into the story, but no, I don't, I don't <laughs> think that's actually the case. Um, you know, I'll, I'll find my own pop culture just fine. Thank you very much. I'm not quite that cool. I depend on my 12 and 15 year old. <laughs> Absolutely. I depend on my six year old. Friend, <laughs> so uh, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for, for being here and thanks for listening. Awesome, okay. thank you.